Uh, we're in this series, Why This, Why This, Why Now? Uh, we've been trying to kind of navigate through all the stuff that we're going through, and obviously it's tough, it's hard, uh, it affects everybody, it affects everything. Uh, you know, we, we get that, and so we're just kind of breaking some of this down. We started off, well, why this? You know, we said, well, you know, God's shaking us. He's shaking, uh, he's shaking the world, and, and anytime God, there's a shaking, He wants us to hear Him uh, and listen to Him. And, and the condition of our heart is going to determine whether we hear God or not. And so we talked about that. Then in, last week, we tried to unpack and say, well, you know, why us? Why us? And we looked at the fact that, you know, on a day that Israel had the greatest experience from the hand of God on the dedication of the temple, and right on the heels of that, uh, God gives uh, Solomon uh, this verse in 2 Chronicles 7, 14 that we, we quote all the time, my people called by my name will humble themselves and seek my face and turn from the wicked ways. I'll hear from heaven and will forgive their sin and heal their land. Well, why did, why did God give them, you know, get, tell that to him? Uh, on this high and holy time in the life of Israel. Well, he said, you know, here's the thing. You've had a great experience. Hand is on you, but you're going to forget. You're going to drift. People do. And, and so when that happens, he said, I might have to sing plagues. Uh, I might have to shake the earth again or whatever. But when that happens, the reason why it's happening is to get my people who are called by my name to humble themselves, seek my face, and turn from their wicked ways. And so we, we talk about we drift. Matter of fact, we drift so much, and even Jesus himself had to give us a, 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 you know, an ordinance where he expected the church to, to remember several times a year. And some churches remember it every Sunday, so nothing wrong with that. But Jesus said, look, you, you need to remember, you need to take time, you need to take, take time of your busy schedule and remember, remember what I did. Remember that I died for you, shed blood for you, my body was beaten for you, uh, all of that. And I would imagine on the night that he gave that in the upper room, those disciples probably said, are you kidding me? Forget you. We're never going to forget you. And Jesus said, yeah, you will. And generations will. So that's why he said for the church, several times a year, man, make sure that you do. We call it the Lord's Supper. Make sure you observe this. Because if you don't, I want you to remember me. Because if you don't, you're going to forget me. And that's just, that's just the way we are. Well, today, we're going to try to tackle uh, this question, why now? Why are we going through what we're going through now? Why, why don't we go through 10 years ago? Why, why couldn't this be, you know, 10 years from now, whatever? Why are we going through this now? And it's an elephant in the room, and it's a question that people have been asking for a long time. And so what we're going to try to unpack today and just kind of, you know, address today is this business. Is the coronavirus and all of the, the uh, things that we're going through in the nation and in the world today, is it? the signs of the end times. Are we living in the end times? And is this the sign of the end times? And we're going we're gonna to look at that. And by the way, we should uh, look at that. Uh, I'm assuming that you believe Jesus came the first time. Is there anybody here who believes Jesus came the first time? Say a big amen. Amen? So I'm assuming you got to believe, if you believe Jesus came the first time, you got to believe that Jesus is coming uh, again. Uh, 216 chapters in the New Testament, over 300 references to his second coming. 23 out of the 27 books of the New Testament mention in some way, shape, or form the coming of Jesus again. So if we believe he came the first time, got to believe that Jesus is coming again. So we're going to examine that today. Is the coronavirus, is the uh, social unrest and racial, is that... Are we, is this signs of the end times, or is this just something that's happening? We're going to talk about that. Father, thank you for your word today that we're going to read. Thank you for the music, Lord. Lord, thank you for Jason and this band. And Lord, just thank you for how they allowed me to worship, Lord. I, I needed the, the songs that they sang. I, I need that, Father. And Lord, I just thank you for them. Thank you for their willingness, and thank you for the gifts that you've given them to bless us with. Father, thank you uh, for these that are here today and those that have been on campus today. Those that are watching online, Father, that we can connect with them. Thank you for them. We just praise you in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Two guys stand on the side of the road with a big sign that said, the end is here. And a guy pulls up beside him and he said, you Christians, he said, that's what I, he said, that's what I hate about you guys. He said, you've been saying that for centuries, and it's not happening. It's not going to happen, and I don't believe it. Nobody else believes it, 
And why don't y'all just go back to your churches and do, do our, quit standing on the street trying to remind me that the end is here. I don't believe it. So he get, takes off in his car and he runs off the end of the road into the river. And the two guys looked at each other and said, you know what, we're not even Christians. That guy had it wrong. We're not even Christians. He said, but maybe we ought to change our sign to say bridges out. (laughs) You know what I'm saying? So, you know, and and so when anytime, anytime some preacher, you know, talks about the end times, people say, well, you've been talking about that for, for centuries. And, you know, I don't, I don't, I don't believe that. And and those kind of things. Well, we do need to believe it. And so we're going to, we're going to look at it uh, today. Uh, Now, uh, Jesus told the Pharisees, in Matthew chapter 16, I and mean, that's not where we're going today, but he told the Pharisees, he said, you know what? You can look and you can see that a storm is coming. Uh, you, can, you can see the, the sky and you can tell when a storm is coming. Even though the storm is not here yet, you can see when it's coming. He said, but the strange thing about it is you can't discern the in, in times. You can't discern the signs of the times. And, uh, and, and so that's true. You know, the, the bottom line is I don't even give the weatherman a, a second glance when there's not a cloud in the sky, but you let the storms come up and you let the winds come up, then I want to know what he knows. And we're not the only ones in history that wanted to know, are these the signs of the time? When is the end of the world coming? We're not the only ones that wanted to know that. By the way, the McLaughlin uh, Research Institute for Biomedical Science, uh, it is a nonprofit secular organization. Uh, so you can imagine, uh, you know, who, who reads their, you know, publications or who answers their questions or whatever. Well, they did a poll. This is just a couple of weeks ago. So the McLaughlin Research Institute for Biomedical Science did a poll among their readers, you know, once again, nonprofit but non-Christian at all. And they just were curious about what people were thinking about the COVID-19, the, the, the virus. And to their amazement, 43% of the secular people that read this secular, you know, publication, 43% of them said they thought the coronavirus and the events that are taking place right now are the signs of the times that America needs to get back to God. That wasn't even part of the question. And that just kind of blew their mind. And so this is what people are thinking. Is this the end time? Do, do we really need to get back to God? Is God trying to tell us something? And we're not, we're not just the only ones thinking that. Uh, the world is thinking that too. But disciples certainly thought that. And so the disciples asked Jesus that very, that very question. So let's take a Bible. Grab your Bible. Turn your Bible on. If you're watching online, get a hold of the Word of God. And we're going to look at Luke chapter 21. Luke chapter 21. We're going to begin at verse 6. But let me give you a little background. Jesus and disciples are standing at the temple. Uh, by the way, Luke 21, this is where the widow gives her might. You know, she gives everything she had. Everybody else is giving big amounts of money, whatever. She just had a little tiny might, not even worth a penny, but Jesus honored it. So anyway, so they're standing at the temple and they're admiring the beauty of the temple and it was beautiful. The world had never seen anything like this temple. Uh, even though Herod had come in, I mean, the temple had been, you know, the temple had been destroyed, uh, you know, and, and then Zerubbabel, you know, rebuilt it. And Herod came in and he even rebuilt it more, but it was still a beautiful edifice. It, it was still a beautiful thing. Uh, one of the wonders of the world. And so even the disciples are watching these people give their, you know, their offerings, you know, to, the, to, to God and to the temple. And they're admiring the beauty of the temple. And it was beautiful. And it was something to behold. But in the midst of that, Jesus tells them this in Luke 21, verse 6. Jesus said, these things that you see, he's talking about the things around the temple, the temple itself, the days will come when not one stone will be left on another and will not be thrown down. Then they said, teacher, so when will these things happen? And what will be the sign when these things are about to take place? And then he said, watch out, you're not deceived, for many will come in my name saying, I'm he, and the time is near, don't follow them. Now when you hear of wars and rebellions, don't be alarmed. Indeed, it's necessary that these things take place, but the end won't come right away. Then he told them, nation will rise against nation. By the way, everybody just look up here, man, if you're watching online, pay attention to this. You might want to underline that. The Greek word for nation here is ethnos. That's where we get ethnic from. Literally, it's race against race. Nation against nation. Race against race. He said, that's part of the the signs of the end time. He said, and kingdom against kingdom, and there'll be violent earthquakes and famines and plagues, various places. There'll be terrifying sights and great signs 
from heaven. All right, everybody look up here just a minute. Now, what he's talking about is the world in general. What he's talking about is the signs of the end time. These are things that are going to happen to the world in general. But notice the conversation changes just a little bit in verse 12. Verse 12, he says, but now, now he's, going to go for, he's going to change the conversation from the world in general to the disciples in particular. This is what he said. He said, but before all these things, they will lay hands on you and persecute you. They will hand you over to the synagogues and the prisons, and you'll be brought before kings and governors because of my name. This will give you an opportunity to bear witness. Go down to verse 17. You'll be hated by everyone because of my name, but not a hair of your head will be lost. By your endurance, gain your lives. In other words, you keep your eyes on me. By your endurance, you're going to make a difference. I'm going to use you. You're going to gain your life. You won't lose your life. And then in verse 24, they... Uh, that's talking about the Jews in particular, they will be killed by the sword and led captive into all the nations in Jerusalem will be trampled by the Gentiles until the times of the Gentiles are fulfilled. Now, Jesus is speaking to his disciples in 33 AD, and he makes five pro prophetic predictions that are absolutely amazing that he, that he shared with his disciples in 33 AD. Let me, let me give you the, the five prophecies real, real quick, all right? Here it is. His disciples, those, the guys he's talking to, his disciples would be persecuted, arrested, and killed. Number two, the temple, that beautiful temple that they're admiring is going to be destroyed. Number three, the Jewish nation will be scattered. And, and ushering in what Jesus called the times of the Gentiles. So the new Jewish nation, now he's speaking in Jerusalem at the temple that is totally inhabited by Jews. He said they're going to be scattered, and it's going to usher in what, what Jesus called the times of the Gentiles. And then he said, but the times of the Gentiles will come to an end. That's, that's part of the prophetic prediction. The times of the Gentiles will come from men. And then he makes this startling uh, prophecy as he looks at his disciples and he's, and he's talking to them in particular and he says and not a hair on your head will be lost not a hair on your head will be lost now that's that's the prophetic uh, prophecy that Jesus gave now let me give you the fulfillment of what he said now keep in mind he's talking to them in 33 AD all right number one as early as 40 AD, just seven years after Jesus' resurrection, the, his disciples were arrested. Many of them, they, they were killed. Uh, they were imprisoned. And by the way, the ringleader of that group was a guy named Saul, who Jesus saved and changed his name to Paul, who wrote so much of the New Testament. God's, God is good all the time. In 70 AD, 70 AD, the temple was destroyed. And, there, and, there, and there's not... There's only one section of the temple that's still halfway intact, and everything else was, was, was torn apart on that temple. By the way, we're still going to Israel. As far as I know, Chris and I, Pastor Chris and I are still taking a group to Israel uh, back in, in next March, 2021. And, uh, and if you haven't signed up, you ought to go. Now you say, well, it's expensive. It's like $4,700. But I'm telling you, it's worth every dime of it. And if you don't have it, sell a car. You know what I'm saying? I mean, really. And we, let me tell you why. Because we're going to take you to a place where the streets of Jesus, where the very streets of Jesus walked on, and you will still see those massive stones on, uh, that are laying on that street. And when I'm talking about massive stones, folks, I'm talking about stones almost the length of this building. And how they got them on top of each other, I'll never know. But it is an amazing thing to see. And those stones are torn apart and they're scattered on the very street that Jesus walked on. You get to see that when you go to the Holy Land. So in 70 AD, the temple was destroyed. Now in 73 to 163 AD, the Jews literally were scattered. They were persecuted and they were scattered. As a matter of fact, in 163 AD, 97,000 Jews were taken captive and sent to other countries, which means for 1,800 years, only Gentiles occupied Jerusalem. 
Only Gentiles. And Jesus said to them, this would happen. And that happened in 163. Happened about 160 years after Jesus said it was going to happen. And so it's, it ushered in the times of the Gentiles. And for 1,800 years, you, you, you didn't have any Jews. You, you, didn't even have a, you didn't even have a nation of Israel. For 1,800 years, Jesus called this the times of the Gentiles. Number four. Jesus said the times of the Gentiles would come to an end, and that happened. Uh, that happened, I don't know if anybody in this service was around when that happened, uh, but in 1948, uh, Israel declared itself an independent state. The state of Israel was founded in 1948. By the way, we have President Truman to help thank for that. Uh, because he felt like the, they, they, they were trying to figure out where to put all the, the Jews after World War II. They were trying to best where, where, to, where to put them. And it was President Truman that said, look, they, they need to go back to Palestine. They need to go back to Israel where they belong. Anyway, but the city of Jerusalem was still occupied by Gentiles. The city of Jerusalem was still ruled or governed by Gentiles, even in 1948, Israel was declared a, uh, an independent state. But in 1968, and uh, many of us were alive in 1968, we have what we call the Six Day War. Now, now, by the way, you need to Google all this and you need to read all this because the Six Day War is, is such a miracle of how Israel won the Six Day War. They call it the Yom Kippur War as well. The Six Day War, it is, it, is, it is as amazing as anything that Gideon ever experienced with his 300, you know, taking on thousands of the enemy. It is an amazing thing that what happens. By the way, it's an amazing thing that Israel became an independent state in 1948. But in 1968, after the Six-Day War, Israel took over, or the Jews took over the city of Jerusalem. For the very first time, in 1800 years, Jews were back in Jerusalem. Jesus said the times of the Gentiles would come to an end, and it did in 1968. And by the way, you know, the first thing the Israeli soldiers did when they won the war, of the Six-Day War, they went to the Western Wall, the only part of the temple, of, of Herod's temple, the, the same wall that was there when Jesus was there. They went to that Western Wall, and they knelt, and they wept, and they prayed. And Jews have been doing that ever since 1968. Now, you call it the Wailing Wall, and you've probably seen pictures of the ascetic Jews that are rocking back and forth and all of that. Well, they've been doing that ever since. Because why? What, what are they doing? What are they praying for? Well, they're, they're praying for uh, the rest of the temple to come back. They're praying that they'll occupy, uh, get rid of the Dome of the Rock where the Muslims own, get rid of all that, and that it'll all be restored like God intended. That's what they're praying for. So the bottom line is, all of this took place. All of this has taken place in, in the last couple of years. So here, Jesus makes these tremendous predictions of what's going to happen that happened exactly like he said. But then he's got one more prophecy that he gave that is kind of unusual. And he looked at those disciples and he said, now I'm going to tell you through all of this, through the wars, the rumors of wars, you know, racial, you know, fighting and fussing and plagues and earthquakes and, you know, all of these disturbing, he said, through all this, not one hair of your head will be lost. Wait a minute, time out. Now that prophecy was not fulfilled. I mean, what, what, do, you do, with the, what do you do with the Holocaust? What do, you, what do you do with the Jews, six million, over six million Jews that were killed by Hitler? What do you, how in the world, Jesus, can you say not one hair of your head be lost? Well, there's only one way you can interpret that, and you have to understand two things. Number one, you have to understand who's talking to. Remember, he changed the conversation from things that are happening in general to things that were happening to those disciples in particular. And not only were they disciples, but they were also believers. Jesus knew they would become followers of his, that after the resurrection, they would become believers. So Jesus is not just talking about those disciples. He's talking about all disciples that come after them. So you got to understand. Then you got to understand about the word lost, lost. Uh, the Greek word for lost is apolemy. It, it, it literally means perish, perish. Uh, it's, the, it's the same word that Jesus used 
to tell to Nicodemus in John 3, 16, where he said, for God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son that whosoever believes in him would not perish or be lost, but not perish, apollome, but have everlasting life. So we know when we're talking about we will not perish, we know we're not talking about the physical body. Jesus is not talking about the physical body. The physical body is just a temporary thing. Uh, you and I, you know, we, it's just what we recognize, but this is not us. It's just a physical body, and the physical body is going to die. Your body is going down, Bubba. Look at your driver's license from 10 years ago. Can I get an amen? Amen? I mean, we, you know, gravity's catching up with all of us, and some more than others, all right? And Jesus said, no, no, I'm not talking about, I'm not talking about that through all of this that you won't die. I'm not talking about the physical body. The physical body is just here for a, a, a little short time. Uh, I'm talking about your existence. I'm talking about your everlasting life. He said, through all this, and ladies and gentlemen, he's talking to us too. I don't care what you're going through. It doesn't matter what we're going through. It doesn't matter about pandemic. It doesn't matter about unrest and all that. The bottom line is, if you're a believer in Jesus Christ, you are safe and secure. And yes, your body may die, but the real you that never dies is always in the arms of Jesus and all God's people's up. Amen. Come on, give the Lord a hand clap of praise for that. That's right. That's true. It doesn't matter what we're going through. And that's what Jesus said. And he said, listen, I want to tell you something. You're not, one hair, listen, one hair of your head will not be lost. Jesus got, he knows everything's going. How many of you know that he, he knows everything that's happening? And he said, not one hair of your head will be lost. And, and, for, and for some of y'all, uh, it's going to come back. All right, anyway, so, 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 so he's, he's not talking about the physical body, but he's talking about the security, the everlasting life that we have in Jesus. And people say, well, you know, I don't know, but once saved, always saved. I, that's what you Baptists say. No, 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 that is so Bible. And Jesus talked about it. Jesus said this. He said, I'm telling you, your body may die, but the bottom line is when you're in me, not one hair of your head will be lost. You're intact. I've got you. And all God's people said so, amazing. Just in, just in one conversation, Jesus gives these prophecies, and they all come true. Some of them 1,800 years later, but they all come true. So, yes, we need to take close attention to the signs of the times and what the Bible is teaching about end times. Because it's happening. If it happened the first time, you better believe it's going to happen again. It doesn't matter how long it's been. Day of the Lord's a thousand years. A thousand years is a day. It doesn't matter. But Jesus is coming again. Do I have anybody that believes that today? So, because that's true, with all that we're going through, how do we live? How do we live? How do we make the most of that? And, I, and we got so many people that have opinions about that. You know, they got opinions about what we're doing in the church. You know, we ain't doing enough. We're doing too much. I mean, you know, you, you can't win for losing. So the bottom line is this. When it comes to your life, my life, how do you navigate through this? What do you do? Well, Jesus gives an answer. He, he already tells us what to do. And here they are. If you're a note taker, you might want to write, write these three things down. Number one, he said, first of all, don't be afraid. Don't be afraid. Look at verse 9. He said, when you hear of wars and rebellions, don't be alarmed. Indeed, it's necessary these things take place, but the end won't come right away. Listen, it doesn't matter what we was going through. How many of you say amen? God's got this. And all God's people say it. Not only does he have this, he has you. He said, listen, you don't have to be alarmed. By the way, let me say this. Anytime a preacher preaches about end times and end time events, people think what we're trying to do is scare people and, uh, into heaven. You know, scaring people out of hell and getting people, it's a scare tactic. It's not, it was never meant to be a scare tactic, and it's not a scare tactic. By the way, if I could scare you and get you out of hell into heaven, I'd do it. I mean, I'd get up here every Sunday and go, boo! <laughs> but you can't, you can't do that. That's, that's not the intent. Always understand this, the fact that the Bible talks so much about the second coming of Jesus was done for one purpose and one purpose only, and that's to give people on this earth that believe in Jesus 
hope and peace. That's what it's for. It's, it's, it's to comfort us. That's what he said. He said, comfort one another with these words when you hear about the end times, when you hear about Jesus coming again. You see, our problem is, for so long, we have it so good, we don't want this to be over. We, we, don't, we don't want to get out of here, man. I, I got it pretty good down here. I, you know, I'm, I'm, I'm good, thank you. And I don't want to be over. But you just think about the persecuted brothers and sisters for the myriads of times that every day they wake up, they're waking up and saying, Lord, even so today, come, Lord Jesus. Deliver me out of this mess that I'm in. Matter of fact, when this was all given, when, when God gave the vision to John, it was under search persecution. Remember, John was exiled to the Isle of Patmos. It was meant for believers to say, even so, Come, Lord Jesus, today. And i got to be honest with you. I'm praying that more than I've ever prayed it. I, 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 listen, I'm so sick of the news. I'm so sick of the changes. I'm so sick of yelling at my TV. And my TV don't yell back. I'm so, I'm so sick of going, what are you thinking? I'm so sick of that. You know what I'm saying? Lord, we've got to be at the end. And it's perfectly fine with me. If you'd come today and deliver us from all this mess. Now, if that scares you, the fact that Jesus could come today, then you need to check up on it. You need to ask yourself, why? Why does that scare you? Because it's not meant to scare you. It's meant to comfort you. And so Jesus, that's what Jesus said. He said, look, when you hear all this thing, and he could probably see it on the look of their faces. He said, don't be alarmed. Don't be alarmed. Not one single hair in your head is going to be lost. You're going to be just fine through all of this. So how many times the Bible got to tell us, don't fear, fear not, be courageous. How many times it got to tell us that? I know, you know, there are people who say, well, there's a fear not for, there's 365 fear nots in the Bible, one for every day. Well, that sounds good. But the bottom line is you take fear not and all of the, aspir- all the you know, offshoots of fear not and don't be afraid and be courageous. I mean, it's, well, it's much, much more than 365. There's a lot of them out there. So the bottom line is over and over and over again, God said, don't be afraid, you know, be courageous. I got you. Not one single hair of your head is going to be lost, no matter what you go through. Second thing Jesus said, he said, decide. Everybody say decide. Decide not to worry. Decide not to worry. And by the way, it's your decision. It's my decision. Look what he said in verse 14. He said, therefore, make up your minds. Your decision. Make up your minds not to prepare your defense ahead of time, for I'll give you such words and wisdom that none of your adversaries will be able to resist or contradict. In other words, Jesus said, look, it's your decision how you're going to handle this, but make up your minds that you're, that you, listen, what he's saying is, he said, don't worry about what you're not going through yet. Why, why are you worried about what you're not going through? And understand this, when you, and if you go through it, I've got, listen, I will give you the grace that you need. How many of you know that, yes, I'm saved by grace, I'm kept by grace, but I'm also led every day by the grace of God? In other words, there are things that I'm not going through right now that I don't need the grace of God to go through. But when I do go through it, I'll have the grace of God. Can I get an amen? Amen? You said, the doctor told me tomorrow, you got cancer. And uh, you got six weeks to live. Well, well my first thought would be, I, I, can't, I can't go through that. I mean, you know, I, I want to see my grandkids grow up. I'm already seeing them grow up too, too fast, but I, I can't do that. But you know what the Holy Spirit would say? He said, of course you feel like you can't because you're not going through it yet. But once you start going through it, I'll give you the grace to go through it. Can, does anybody believe that? And by the way, as a pastor of this church, I see it all the time. We have, we have people in our church that have cancer. They're on their deathbed. They're dying of cancer. They're slowly being, and, and yet the grace of God on their life. You know, we'll, we'll try to call them up, and before all this, we try to go visit them and see them, and every single time you're walking away blessed. You're trying to bless them. You're trying to give them encouragement. All they're doing is giving you encouragement. Now, how do you answer for that? You say, well, they're very brave people, and they're better Christians than I am. Well, I got, they are brave people, but they're not a better Christian than I am. 
say, why, because you're the pastor? No. Listen, they're just believers like we are. And when you're going through something, God will give you the grace to go through it. And all God's people say, and Jesus said, don't worry about what you're not going through because you're not going through it. But when you go through it, I'll give you the grace to go through it. And all God's people say, it's an amazing thing about the Holy Spirit of God. That's why we live every single day by the grace of God. Matter of fact, if you'd have told me six months ago, you know what? Church is going to shut down. It's going to shut down. It's going to be a, there's going to be a pandemic and the church is going to shut down. And you don't, you're, not going to, you're not even going to have near half the crowds of what you, what you, what you had six months ago. And, uh, you're going to, and people are not going to be able to get close to each other. And the stores are going to you know, shut down. And people are going to lose their jobs and all of that. And if, I, and, I, and if you told me that six months, I said, behind the world, if that's true, we can't, we can't live through that. We can't get through that. We can't navigate through that. But we are. A little bit every day. I'm not saying we're doing it perfect, but I'm just telling you every single day, we're just trusting Jesus and all God's people said, and God's given us the grace on every single day. Why are you worried about, why are you worried about what's going to happen tomorrow when you don't even know tomorrow's going to come? Just allow the Holy Spirit to give you the grace to go through what we're going through right now. And that's exactly what Jesus said. And then the last thing, the last thing. Jesus said, stand firm in your faith. Stand firm in your faith. Look look at verse 13. He said, this will give you an opportunity to bear witness. The darker the night, the brighter the light. It's not over. Just because these things are happening all around you, that's no excuse for you to bury your head in the sand and say, us four and no more. He says, as a matter of fact, when you see all this stuff happening around you, this is when you shine the best. This is when you can bear witness. Now listen to me and listen well. Aaron Lee Baptist Church, I have no idea how long this is going to go on. I don't. This used to be our largest service. Now it's our smallest. We used to have a ton of kids in this building. Now we don't. Uh, I have no idea. I have no idea if we'll get back to the crowds that we had before or if we'll ever do that. I don't know. Well, I'm praying we will. But here's what I do know. Listen to me. Listen to me say amen. Come on. One thing I do, I, we may not, this, this may be it. We, we, we may get down in the whole church and this is us. You know, that's, but one thing I do know, no matter what we're going through, no matter, no matter what has been proclaimed, no matter what's happening all around us, it cannot stop us from upholding the gospel of the Lord Jesus Christ. And all God's people say it. It can't do that. We cannot. Listen, we got to be a bright light, shining a dark place. Yes, we may have to do things different. We may have to look at things different. I don't know. But it cannot and will not stop us from telling a lost and dying world, your only hope is the Lord Jesus Christ. And all God's people say, it. can't stop us. And it won't. It won't. Now, how we do that, God will have to give us the grace to know what to do. But I believe he will give us the grace to know what to do and when to do it. Uh, we did the survey among the parents, and uh, the, the answers were very close about starting back with children's ministries in July or in August, and it was kind of, you know, 50-50, whatever. So we just decided that August, the, fir- the first Sunday in August, we're going we're gonna to attempt to bring our kids back, our preschool, our children, our students, and all of that. Uh, students may meet me, me back, uh, especially on Sunday nights before then, and that's wonderful. But on, on the first Sunday in August, we're going to try to bring all of our small groups back, your Sunday school class and all that. We're going to try to bring it all back. But once again, who knows what the news is going to be tomorrow? So don't put that in, don't, don't have that set in stone, but that's our plan. First Sunday in August, everything, everything comes back. We'll still practice safe environment, social you know, distancing and all that the best we can. We're not going to be unsafe no matter, you know, there, there are a lot of people who say, well, this, there's nothing to this. Well, I think there is. So we're going to be safe. But I don't know how long 
we're not going to be able to shake each other's hand or whatever, whatever. that we've got to be guarded. You know, when Jesus saved me, I, I love my parents. My parents were wonderful, but we were not huggers. We didn't touch in our family. Uh, we just didn't. But when I got saved, God, God gave me the gift of preaching, and he gave me the gift of hugging. Can you get amen? You know what I'm saying? Now, I, I don't, I'm, not good, I'm not good at the preaching. I'm pretty good at the hugging. And, uh, and I, don't, I don't like the fact that I can't reach out to you like I want to. And you want to reach out to me too. I get that. I, it may, I don't know. That, that may be a societal thing from here on out. Who knows? But one thing won't change. The fact that Jesus is coming again. So let me ask, answer the question. Pastor, are we living in end times? You better believe we are. But then again, we've been living in end times ever since Jesus went up to heaven from the Mount of Olives. And 500 witnesses saw him. And the angel from heaven said, you men of Galilee, why are you staying gazing up into heaven? The same Jesus that you saw go up into heaven will come again in like manner. Do I have anybody to believe that today? So because that's true, let's, uh, let's pray and let's seek for ways that we can make a difference to those out there who will never set foot in this building, probably would never set foot in this building, especially now, ever. So let's think of ways. Let's be in prayer. Let's let the Holy Spirit of God guide us because, yes, we are living in times. Now, I don't know when Jesus is going to come again. I'm not a date setter, and I think it's wrong to be a date setter. Even Jesus don't know when he's coming again. He just said he's going to come like a thief in the night. To a bed in bed, one to be taken, one to be left. I don't know. I'm not on the planning committee. I'm just on the getting ready committee. You know all God's people said? He could come today. Signs are no time. He could come today. He said he could come today. Or it may be 2,000 years from now. I don't know. All I know is I am certain of this. We are closer to his coming than we've ever been before. And personally, I think we're closer to his coming than we were three months ago. So the question is, are you ready? I'm not trying to scare you. I'm trying to comfort you. And if it scares you that I'm asking you, are you ready? Then if I were you, I'd make sure I'm ready. Because I don't want, I want that assurance. I don't want to be in a group that has to worry about anything. I want to be in that group that knows no matter what happens, not one hair of my head is going to be lost. We will not perish. Do you know that? You're watching online. Do you know that? Do you know that you know that Jesus could come today? Are you ready for his return? If you don't know, there's a text message there. You can, you can text us and say, I'm not sure, Pastor, pray for me. How can I be sure? How can I know? And we will text you. We'll, we'll get back up with you. I promise. We, we've, got, we've got answers for that out of the Word of God. And if there's anybody here, I'd just like for every head to be bowed and every eye closed. Everybody here with your head bowed and your eyes closed, if you're not sure, do you know that you know that no matter what happens today, not one single hair of your head is going to be lost? Do you know you're saved? Do you know you're safe and secure? Are you in Jesus? And if you're here today and you say, Preacher, I think so, or I hope so, but I'm not sure, and I'd like to be sure, and I want you to pray for me. Would you slip up your hand? Anybody in the building today? Slip it up. Raise it up. Well, Father, thank you for your word. Thank you, Father. The word of God is such a miracle word. It's amazing. The fulfilled prophecies that we see before our very eyes, even in this day, that you said and the prophet said thousands of years ago would take place, and they are taking place. No other book does that because the Bible is not a book. 
is the inerrant, infallible Word of God. And everything you said about the second coming is happening. May we be ready. May you find us being a light in a dark time. In Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Anybody realize Jesus met with us today? Come on, let's give the Lord a hand clap of praise. We're glad that you are here today.